Thank you very much. Who's having a great conference so far? We were all talking at dinner, just what a delightful group this has been. And we've, many of us have been speaking at this conference many years, but the questions you have, the energy you're bringing, the enthusiasm for the Word of God has been very contagious for all of us as the presenters. So thank you for being here. But I also want to thank the university here as they're celebrating 40 years of conferences. Uh, that, is, that is just an, an incredible <laughs> achievement here. How many souls, thousands of souls have been blessed over these 40 years from these conferences? I know personally, I remember back in the early 90s when I was working in Midland, Michigan. I, I took our youth group down here to this conference. I remember attending just as a, as a layman when I was there in Michigan and coming back a few weeks later for defending the faith. And little did I know, if a, a, a little, maybe two years after that, I would be here as a student. And I remember coming to all the conferences while I was doing my masters here and then for, for the great blessing of being able to present at these conferences for a little over 10 years now I think has been a great joy for me and I just know I meet people from all over the country who have come to a very uh, one of the various conferences here at Francisco University and, and and it has been a great impact on their lives they've said so we're so grateful for the university to put this on so grateful for you to be here and celebrate this in this 40th year as we're turning our attention to the third chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians, I want to jump in, in somewhere in the middle. I'm going to look at uh, chapter 3, verse 17, as kind of something to give us a, uh, a framework for the theme I'm going to be running at, uh, running, running through here in this chapter. And in chapter 3, verse 17, Paul says, Brethren, join in imitating me and mark those who so live as you have an example in us. So Paul here is telling the uh, Philippians to, to look at him as an example and to look at the, the others that he sent, people like Timothy, and, uh, as, as a great example. And at first glance, we could look at that and say, man, does Paul seem like he's boasting here? Is this a little bit of just self-righteousness? I mean, imagine if I stood up and said, hey, everybody, I want you to look at me as a great example for Christian living. And join with all the other speakers here, you know, really, just mark us as, you know, the great examples to follow. You'd kind of feel, wow, that just seems a little, a little boastful here. But I, I really think what Paul's doing here is using language of discipleship here. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And at the heart of discipleship is this idea of imitating the master, walking in the ways of the rabbi. Uh, and in fact, when a rabbi would gather students together, they, they didn't just teach in a classroom like we might think of teachers teaching today, but they would gather disciples and, and, and not just give oral lessons, but really share life with the student, with the disciple. Uh, think about what Jesus did when Jesus gathered the, the disciples together. He didn't say, okay, meet me on that mountain on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 o'clock, and, and I'm going I'm to teach you about the Beatitudes. No, he, he went camping with them, basically, for three years. Now, you can get to know people really well if you go camping with them. <laughs> I, I'm reminded of Pope Francis. He says that shepherds should take on the smell of the sheep. When you go camping with people, you really can take on the smell of, of the sheep there. But, but Paul... Or, or, or Jesus, he, he gathers the disciples for three years, and, he, and the disciples are learning not just from what he teaches, but from the way he lived. They're watching the way he prayed. They're watching the way he studied. They're watching the way he served the poor. He cared for those who were suffering. They're watching the way he debated with his opponents. They're watching the way he taught. In fact, there's an expression that could describe this idea of, of following in the footsteps of the rabbi. It is, more is caught than taught. And so the disciples are brought into a whole way of life, and it's that whole way of life that they pass on to the people that they're discipling. And so the life of a disciple also, another key characteristic, is that it's not a one-time choice. It's not as if Matthew was called and Peter was called and they said yes on the Sea of Galilee, or they said yes in the tax collector's office, and then it's all done. It's an ongoing relationship. It's an ongoing process of conversion, of conforming your life ever more to the ways of the master. And in, in terms of Christ, uh, it's all about giving more, loving more, serving more, surrendering more. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, I think is concerned that there are many Christians out there 
who kind of just settle into their identity and aren't really living in discipleship. And that's why in his great apostolic exhortation, which is the, the title of uh, uh, the, this conference, Joy of the Gospel, uh, he calls us to renew our encounter with Christ and to really live as missionary disciples, he says. He's concerned that there are many Christians that kind of just settle into their own comfort zones and they become mediocre, they become stagnant, they become what I like to call Chicago Cubs Catholics. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? Any, any, who's from, any, any Cubs fans out there, by the way? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm from Chicago. I lived an hour away from Wrigley Field for a while and, and I'm a, I am a Cubs fan. I am a, I am a Cubs fan. But being a Cubs fan, there's just lots of suffering with... with <laughs> With the, so it's very Catholic, you know. The only difference between Catholic suffering and Cubs suffering is that Catholic suffering is redemptive. <laughs> Cubs suffering is just pointless. You know, it's like every, every year you get to June and, and the Cubs fan is saying the same three words, maybe next year, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, I know this year we're doing well. We got that guy from the Red Sox, the general manager, and there's this farm team, and I keep hearing all this hope and stuff. But, you know, we'll, we'll make 500 maybe this year. And as a Cubs fan, you go, well, that, we should do that every once in a while. And maybe every decade or two we'll make the playoffs. But the World Series? No, that's just for the really, really good teams. You know, that's not for us. Yeah, and, and that's the attitude that some of us might have as Catholics, that we can fall into, well, I follow the church, I follow the Pope, I go to Mass, I believe the things. But are we really growing in our discipleship? Are we really imitating St. Paul, who is imitating Jesus Christ evermore? It reminds me of something that happened in my, my family recently. There was um, a, a babysitter who told us the story about what, what went on with my, my five-and-a-half-year-old daughter. So my, my, my daughter was playing with a friend that was over, and, and they were, they were, she was tickling the friend and getting a little rough. And so the babysitter just said, oh, you shouldn't do that. And all of a sudden, as soon as she realized that she had done something wrong, she just stood up really straight. And she had this look of fear. And she just said, I'm trying to be good. <laughs> and then the babysitter asked, said, oh, well, how's that going for you? And she goes, with this look of real sorrow, it's really, really hard. <laughs> But that struggle to be good, that struggle to take on more the character of Christ, it's hard. And that struggle is discipleship. Uh, and, and what we're going to look at tonight is I want to take a look at how St. Paul in chapter 3 is really helping us to apply what he already wrote about in chapter 2. And the centerpiece of chapter 2, which is really the, the great gem of the whole letter, that great hymn in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, what he does in chapter 3 is basically he's going to challenge us to not just know the hymn, not just believe the theology that's in the th hymn, but to live the hymn. And so for our opening prayer for this presentation, I'd like to just get our minds reflecting on that hymn before we move forward in chapter 3, if we could do that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, in chapter 3, Paul challenges us to live out the hymn, so to speak, to live out this idea of this total self-emptying, this kenosis of Christ, so that then in Christ we may be exalted. We may find our fulfillment that God has in store for us. And so the first way he goes after this, and the application I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring out for us in chapter 3, is, is a question I, I would say, which badges is the question? Which badges? In other words, how do I know I 
am a really faithful Christian, and I, I'm really a part of God's family. This was a question that was on the forefront of Paul's mind here at the beginning of chapter 3. Uh, listen to what he says at the beginning of chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not irksome to me and is safe for you. And then he gives a big warning here to the Philippians. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the true circumcision who worship God in spirit and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Here we're seeing Paul using this very bold language, this strong language, describing his opponents, some group of people that is causing some problems, going to cause some problems with the Philippian community. He's warning them, watch out for these people. He calls them dogs. He calls them evildoers. And these are people who mutilate the flesh. Who are these people? As most scholars recognize, these are the Judaizers. These are Jewish Christians who are wanting to impose the Old Testament ceremonial laws, particularly circumcision, on the Gentiles. The idea when a Gentile wants to convert and become a Christian, there are some of these Christians saying, well, you're going to have to go through the Old Testament process as well. You're going to have to be circumcised. And so a big question then that, that is arising in early Christianity is, how do we know if we are a part of God's people? How do we know who is a part of the covenant people of God? And there were many that were saying circumcision is the chief identity marker, as it was in the old covenant. We still need to do this. This will be our covenant badge. This is how we know we're a part of God's people. But Paul is concerned about this, and, he, and he's saying, no. We don't need that anymore because this sign of circumcision and then the rest of the Old Testament ceremonial laws put us under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant has ended, it has passed. And so he goes on to say here in verse 3, we are the true circumcision. Now what does he mean by that? I think a passage from Romans could be helpful here. Paul makes a similar kind of statement in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, where he says, he who is a Jew, he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And real circumcision is a matter of the heart. In other words, there were some that were boasting in their ethnic identity as being a physical descendant of Abraham. And, and then circumcision was the, was the chief sign of being a part of the descendants of Abraham. But Paul says in Romans 2 that a, a true Jew is one who is one inwardly. And real circumcision is not just a physical thing, it's really a matter of the heart. And that's going to be important for us to understand here. What does he mean when he says real circumcision is a matter of the heart? Here Paul is alluding to a great passage in the book of Deuteronomy. It's one of the great prophetic foreshadowings about the profound work God wants to do in our hearts when he sends his spirit. In Deuteronomy, we have Moses before he is going to die, leave the people, and they're going to go into the promised land, he gives them the law, and he tells them, here are the blessings and the curses of the law. If you're faithful to the law, you're going to be blessed in this land, but if you're unfaithful to the law, you break God's covenant, you're going to lose the land. Just as Adam was expelled out of Eden, you're going to be expelled out of this land. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Paul sa or, or Moses basically says, I know what you're going to do. You're going to end up breaking the law, and you're going to end up in exile. So he gives a prophecy of what's going to happen in the future. Israel isn't going to be faithful. They're going to be carried away in exile. But God is not going to abandon them. God is going to gather them back, and he's going to restore the people. And when he restores the people, he's going to do a magnificent work in their heart. He says, Mo Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, that the Lord will circumcise your heart and cause you to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul. And so Moses is giving a prophecy about something God's going to do in the future that's going to enable Israel to live the law in a way that they couldn't have before, through some work in their heart. And we know that Deuteronomy goes on to say that it's going to help them to be able to keep all of God's commands. And we know that later prophets are going to shed more light on this idea of the great work God will do in our hearts. Prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah uh, are going to talk about how God is going to send his spirit into our hearts. And our weak hearts will be changed. They're going to be transformed with 
Christ's love, with Christ's spirit. And so this is the great key point of St. Paul here, that he's saying, we're the true circumcision. Why? Because we worship in the spirit. We have that spirit that has come into our hearts, that has changed our hearts. Uh, and this is a great gift for us, that we want, if we want to sense our true identity, how do I know if I'm a true Christian? We want to ask, how much am I cooperating with the work of God's grace in my life, God's spirit in my heart? How much is my heart being changed? How much am I taking on more and more the qualities, the characteristics of Christ himself? Uh, there was a great analogy that, uh, in the Catholic tradition to describe the power of the spirit, the power of this, of this grace in our lives. It's the analogy of an iron rod. If you were to take an iron rod and you were to put it into fire, the, the iron rod begins taking on the properties, the characteristics of the fire. It may become orange or red. It becomes very hot. It emits smoke. It begins to take on the properties, the characteristics of, of fire. And it's still a rod, but it takes on the, the quality of fire. And, and, and the same happens when our human nature enters into the furnace of God's love, the furnace of God's Holy Spirit, so to speak. And I know some of you were at one of the presentations where they were talking about the idea of deification, divinization, the idea that we, we become changed, that we aren't just called sons and daughters of God, but as St. John says, we really are sons and daughters of God, transformed by Christ's Spirit, so that His Spirit is changing us, that we take on His very characteristics. We still aren't, we're not God, but we become like God. We become uh, more and more imitating God as his very life is working through us. And so uh, if we want to think about where do we find our true Christian identity, it's going to be found in our cooperating with the Holy Spirit in his work in our hearts, being transformed, as St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, from one degree to another of Christ-likeness. Now, practical application then for us, though, is this. So, you know, I remember preparing for this, this uh, presentation and looking at, okay, it's the Thursday night presentation. I got to get a lot of practical points. And the opening chapter is all about whether or not we should be circumcised. <laughs> so, uh, but, but I do think that, that we do face a, a similar challenge in our own lives in, in, in asking as Catholics, what badges do we cling on to? Where do we find our identity as Christians? You know, some people might be tempted to put their identity more in certain kinds of spirituality. Well, I really like the Franciscan thing, or I like the Carmelite thing. And, and we think that like, that's at the center of what it means to be a Christian. Or maybe it's, I like praise and worship music, or I like traditional hymns, or I like charismatic spirituality, or I like Latin mass, or I like this kind of Bible story, or I like this kind of small group. And, and we, can, we can be focused on those things. But even, as, uh, even, uh, even broader, some of us might put our... our our hope or our or find our identity in things like I'm an Orthodox Catholic, I'm a pro-life Catholic, I'm pro-marriage. And we can say that's what really defines me as a true Christian. And in our day and age, let's be honest, to be a pro-life Catholic is heroic. To be especially a, 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 a Catholic that stands for true marriage, a marriage between a man and a woman that is heroic to stand up and say that today uh, and to be faithful to all the church's teachings. Uh, that, that, you're going to stand out. You are like in the 99 percentile of all the people in the world when you, when you start adding on all those characteristics. And so we who hold those values and, and are willing to, to defend them, willing to die for them, we can start patting ourselves on the back and going, you know, compared to the world out there, we're all really good. I'm just, I'm just doing a lot better than everybody else. But what we have to see is the heart of a disciple isn't simply following the rules. The heart of a disciple isn't about simply having all the right answers. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to be very clear on this. We absolutely need to follow God's moral law. And, and it and is essential that we, 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 we believe all that Christ has revealed and it's, and it's been passed on through the church. But maybe an analogy would be like this. If I were to ask you... Um, or if, you, or someone, if I were to tell you all, hey, I'm a really great basketball player. I'm a really great basketball player. And then you were all to say, oh, so Ted Sri, tell me, tell me, why are you a great basketball player? And I said, because I follow all the rules. <laughs> yeah, really, I, I don't step out of bounds. I don't double dribble. I don't travel with the ball. I'm a great basketball player. LeBron, let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
that doesn't make me a great basketball player, right? I mean, following the rules, essential. You're not going to be a great basketball player if you don't follow the rules. You need that, but, but you need a lot more. And we have to see that the heart of a disciple isn't just following the rules. It's all about participating evermore in Christ's death and resurrection. It's about dying to myself evermore, surrendering more, cooperating with God's grace more, loving more. It's about what we looked at this morning in Brant's presentation about humility. You know, do I really consider the others around me as better than me? Do I really look out for their interests, not just my own interests? This, this, is, the, this is what we need to be growing in, in discipleship. This is, the, this is where we really want to run after, not just the, I got a pro-life badge, or I got a, I'm an Orthodox Catholic badge, or I follow the Pope's teaching badge. Those are all, again, essential, good things to do. We have to do them. But the heart of our Christian faith is more about being transformed by Christ's Spirit, cooperating with His grace. And in fact, the, the, what the saints often said, uh, you know, was a great sign of sanctity, a sign of holiness, wasn't just, did you have all the right answers and did you follow the rules? It was, did you love your neighbor? Did you love your neighbor? Were you patient? Are you patient with the people around you? Do you bear with other people's faults well? Do I, am I generous with my time? And do I care for the poor and for the suffering? Do I really live for others or do I live more for myself? Am I really living this hymn? Am I emptying myself evermore? Now, uh, St. Augustine has a line about this. He was reflecting on uh, Philippians chapter 3. He talked about how the, the true Christian is always pressing on. That's an image from, from Paul later on in the chapter. They were pressing on toward the goal. We're straining forward. Like, like my daughter, I'm trying to be good. It's hard, but I'm, but I'm always growing in my, in, in my own imitation of Christ. St. Augustine says, when he's, he's reflecting on what it, does it really mean to walk with Christ in this way? He says, what does walking mean? I shall answer briefly. It means going forward. <laughs> Examine yourself. You should always be unhappy with what you are if you want to attain what you are not yet. For when you are content with yourself, you stayed where you are because you say, enough, and you're finished that very minute. Always grow, always walk on, always advance. Do not stop on the way. Do not turn back. Do not go off course. One who does not advance is standing still. And so what badge are we going to turn to? How do I know if I'm a faithful Catholic? Is it I went to the conference for the 15th year in a row? Great thing to do. Is it I pray my rosary every day? Excellent thing to do. But those are all things that are going to feed something deeper, and that is my own internal transformation, becoming ever more like Christ, walking in discipleship with Jesus, taking on ever more the qualities of Christ, allowing his grace to change my heart. Now, a second, big the a second theme I want to I consider here is this idea of total self-emptying that we see in the hymn. And Paul talks about this idea next in his own life. Uh, Paul goes on in chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, and gives kind of a, a, a picture of, of what his life was like before he was a Christian. And he's saying, okay, there's these Judaizers that are out there, these people that are really boasting in their ethnic identity, in their status as having been Jews before they became Christians. And, and, he's, and he says, if there's ever been someone who could boast in his ethnic status and his, his, his life as a Jew, it would be me. So verse 4, or verse 5, uh, four and five here. If any other man thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Whoo, what a resume that is. I mean, think about it. He was circumcised. He didn't just say I was circumcised. He says, I was circumcised on the last, on the eighth day. In other words, I, I, I was circumcised right exactly when I was supposed to be. My parents followed the law. I was from the people of Israel, but not just the people of Israel, of the 12 tribes, but particularly of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the, the, the tribes in the southern kingdom that were part of the, 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 the kingdom of Judah, where the Messianic line came from. 
Uh, I, I was part of, uh, I was the Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, I was a Pharisee, the most rigorous, some of the most respected leaders of the Jewish people. I had great zeal, and as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. I mean, Paul was top of the class. He was one of the best Jews in his time. He was a leading teacher, having studied under one of the leading rabbis. He was a, had great impact. He was successful. He was a man in his young age who had already accomplished an awful lot. And yet, Paul considered it all to be dung. Actually, I think Michael Barber brought that out this morning. Uh, it was rubbish, you know, it's often how it's often translated. But he says, all of this to me was just like dung. That's the actual, what the word actually means. Said, in other words, his life radically changed when he encountered Jesus Christ. And he came to see that whatever gain he had, he said, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord. When he encounters Jesus on that road to Damascus, his whole world is turned upside down. Jesus asks him to give up everything, give all that up, and follow him. And his conversion is a real death for Paul. It's a death to his very self, a death to his old ways of thinking, a death to his old ways of living. And yet, he finds great new life in this. And this is the pattern that we see how, in which God works with all the great heroes of the Bible, all the great saints, whether it's Abraham. God calls Abraham to give up everything, to leave everything behind and go to this distant land. And when he's there, he, he challenges him to even give up his own son on Mount Moriah, to be willing to be detached from everything, self-emptying. Moses called at the burning bush to go back to the land of Egypt. He's living a nice, quiet life out there in Midian. Now he's got to go all the way back to Egypt where they're trying to kill him, confront the wicked dictator Pharaoh. He's thinking, well, I just got an easier life here, and God calls him out of that. The Blessed Virgin Mary, we think, well, she made her great fiat, and then, you know, it was very easy until Good Friday. You know, but if you look at her life, <laughs> it's just one constant challenge in, uh, of, of taking out another step of faith, another leap of trust, and entering into greater suffering step by step. You know, she gives her fiat, and then 90, uh, nine months and 40 days later, she's confronted by Simeon, who gives the prophecy about the sword. Imagine being a mom having to bear with that prophecy, knowing one day my son is going to be killed. And then 12 years later, she loses the son in the temple for three days, doesn't know where he was, and, and the Bible says she didn't understand. She didn't understand what was going on there. And when, he, when her son's 30 years old, she commissions him to go off and begin his public ministry, encouraging him at Cana, even though she knows it's going to lead to the sword. And then there's Good Friday, where she gives up everything, her own son, her own flesh and blood, to the Father. And so discipleship is all about this constant growth in kenosis and self-giving. You know, one of the saints in our own times I like to think about uh, when, I, when I was thinking about this hymn is Mother Teresa, Blessed Mother Teresa. You know, uh, many people know about Mother Teresa and her starting the Missionaries of Charity and serving the poor, but they don't know really her interior drama, the great story within her soul. Uh, but that all came out shortly after she died, and, and many of her letters revealed what was really going on inside. And we know that, yes, she became originally a Loretto sister, and that in itself was a heroic step of faith. She left Albania, left her mom, who she was very close to, her family, her dear friends, and in those days, you would never think she would ever come back to that country. In fact, she, when she said goodbye to her mother, she never saw her mother again. Even though her mother lived into the 70s, the, uh, the Albanian communist regime did not allow Mother Teresa to come back. And so she never was reunited with her mother. That was a great pain for Mother Teresa, great suffering. And she goes off to become this missionary sister teaching the middle-class children in India as a Loretto sister. And she's there serving and, and, and having a great impact, doing great work. And on one day on a retreat, she decides that she wants to, to give Jesus a great spiritual gift on this retreat. She said that she wanted to love Jesus as he had never been loved before. And so she made a private vow, a private vow to not refuse Jesus anything under pain of mortal sin. I don't advise you all to go do this. You know, she did this in consultation with spiritual director and all. But it was, this is just shows this radical gift. She just wanted to say yes to whatever Jesus might ask her. I mean, this is an incredible step of faith. And then, years later, she's on a train ride going on another retreat, and Jesus speaks to her and asks her, like he asked St. Paul, to give it all up. To give it all up and start all over again. 
to go leave the Loretto sisters that she had loved, leave her teaching that she loved, and go and serve the poorest of the poor, live like them, eat like them, sleep like them, dress like them. And do you think she was jumping up and down? Oh, cool, I could be on Time Magazine one day and win a Nobel Prize maybe. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus says to her. She was scared. And Jesus says, will you refuse? When there was a question of your soul, I did not think of myself, but I gave myself freely for you on the cross. What about you? Will you refuse? And she goes, he goes on and says, I want Indian nuns, nuns covered with my poverty of the cross. I want obedient nuns covered with my obedience on the cross. I want full of love nuns covered with my charity on the cross. Will you refuse to do this for me? Notice Jesus isn't hiding the cross from her. He's, he's, as he's calling her to start the missionaries of charity, he just says, yeah, these vows, you know, poverty, chastity, obedience, it's all about the cross. It's going to be really hard. And Mother Teresa says, I'm unworthy, I'm sinful, I'm weak, why don't you choose someone else? And Jesus comes back and says, you have become my spouse for my love. And he compliments her. You've done a lot for me. You've become a sister, you've come to India, you've made this vow, you've done all these wonderful things. The thirst you had for souls has brought you so far. Are you afraid now to take one more step for your spouse, for me, for souls? You've taken all these steps of faith. Are you ready to take one more? And then he says, is your generosity growing cold? Am I second to you? I mean, this is Mother Teresa. This is intense. <laughs> Uh, you, think, you think about, man, what would Jesus say to me? But he's really pressing in. He goes on, and listen to it. Next, he says, you did not die for souls. That is why you don't care what happens to them. <laughs> and then he points the problem. You're afraid. You're afraid you're going to lose your vocation, that you'll become a secular, and you'll be found wanting in perseverance. The issue is she was afraid that she'd start this new order and it wouldn't work out and she'd be a failure and she'd become a secular. And mother admits, she goes, I'm so afraid this fear shows me how much I love myself. And she admits she's also afraid of the suffering that will come through leading that Indian life, clothing like them, eating like them, sleeping like them, living like them. How much comfort has taken possession of my, my heart. And then Jesus comes back and says, you have always been saying, do with me whatever you wish. Now I want to act. Let me do it. Do not fear. Do you ever make a prayer like that, by the way? You say, Jesus, hey, whatever you want, be careful. Because <laughs> he may press in and actually call you on it like he did with Mother Teresa. But the idea here is all the great saints, and I'm just using her as one example. You know, they gave some, and then Jesus invites them to give more and to give more, but it's all about a deeper conformity to the hymn of Philippians 2, to that total kenosis, that total self-emptying. And I think today, in our own day and age, Jesus is looking for souls, especially today, who are willing to follow him like Mother Teresa did, like Abraham did, like Paul did, who are willing to give up everything. You know, in Jesus' day when he's out preaching in Galilee, there were all these crowds, these large crowds that followed him, right? Do you ever wonder, where were they on Good Friday? What happened there? I mean, they followed him. Do you remember why they followed him? Because they were amazed at his teaching. Wow, this man teaches with authority, they say. And they were also, you know, so they were really taken in by really dynamic teaching from Jesus. But then they also were taken in by his great miracles and signs and wonders he performed. They said, we've never seen anything like this in all of Israel. This is incredible. But where were they on Good Friday? Just a few followed him all the way to the cross. And I think today in the new evangelization is the Spirit is raising up more and more men and women, laity, religious, priests, clergy, to, 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 to be a part of this renewal. Jesus is out there looking again to see who is willing to enter the hymn, who is willing to give everything. Because there's a lot of people out there that, you know, like learning about their faith. You know, they might listen to a bunch of CDs or read a lot of books, and, and they like feeding themselves, and that's all a good thing. But are they willing to follow Jesus to the cross? There are a lot of people that uh, 
you know, they, they, they go through a little conversion experience and their life is noticeably better. You know, they have better friends and they notice they're a little nicer to be around. Their family life might be a little better. And so there's ex- real benefits in, in, in following God's plan for your life. But am I following this plan for what I get out of it or am I willing to give God everything and realize my life is not my own? There are many people that follow Jesus for the great signs, the, the, the great things he does in our lives, but are we willing to follow him all the way to the cross? Mother Teresa wrote about that a lot. She said that... Uh, few people were with Jesus on Good Friday. But if you want to love Jesus on Good Friday, if you want to draw near to the cross, it's going to hurt. Because when you draw near to the the face of Jesus, if you wanted to kiss Jesus on Good Friday, she says, a thorn may poke you in the head. A nail may pierce you. If you draw near to Jesus like that, it's going to hurt. But here's the great mystery. This is my third point now is that, yes, we're called to live this total kenosis, this total self-emptying, but when we do this, we find not just loss, all is not loss, but we gain so much more. And that's what Paul says. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You know, it's, it's the great law, John Paul II called it the law of ecstasis, the law of, of, of self-giving, going out of oneself. And the idea is that... Uh, when, when I actually live like Christ, when I am I'm like that grain of wheat that goes down to the ground and dies, I, it's going to bear fruit. My life, when I actually live my life for God and for others, my life is actually much more enriched. Uh, John Paul II often said, man finds himself only when he makes himself a sincere gift. So when we live the hymn, when we live for others and we live for God, we experience great peace and great joy as St. Paul will write about in the next chapter, chapter 4. But when we don't live the hymn, instead of self-giving, I live life more for self-getting. I'm always looking at, what do I get out of everything for my life? Instead of self-emptying, pouring my life out to God and to others, if if I'm living a life of grasping, as Paul would say in Philippians, where I'm grasping at life for myself, what do I get out of this? I'm grasping for control, grasping for money, grasping for security. My life is always going to be filled with worry, and anxiety, and frustration, and emptiness. So how do we overcome that? How do we make sure we stay on the task in living the hymn? Uh, So Paul says, if when we don't, we're going to experience great anxiety. How do we avoid anxiety? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas, he has some great treatment on on anxiety in the the virtues, when he's talking about uh, different ways that we can allow our worry to become sinful. So he gives a couple of things here. First of all, he says, when we start making something in this world, like we make it like, this is, I have to have this. I can't imagine I'll be happy without this, whether it's a certain job or a certain position or maybe a certain location, a certain relationship, some dream I have for one of my kids. When I kind of make that, I I have to have that, that's a sign of, of, of something's off. Or maybe when, you know, we're too worried about something and I'm distracted from spiritual things. You know, I'm just worried about this problem, and I can get so preoccupied by a problem or a decision or a dilemma that I don't, I don't really, I'm not really paying attention at Mass. I'm not really focused on my prayer. I remember one time I had to make a decision. This is back in my 20s. I had to make a big decision. I'm trying to decide what to do, and I was all stressed out by this decision. I had this pro and cons list, and I'm trying to figure it all out. I remember I go to my spiritual director, and I, I had this, the, my little notebook. I go, Father, I've been thinking about what I'm supposed to do, and I think this would be good if I do it this, but if I do this, then this would be the benefit. And he's just sitting there kind of going like this, like almost laughing underneath you know, his, 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 his fingers. And, and then finally, after I did my little 10-minute presentation on my pros and cons list, he just looked at me and says, Ted, have you talked to God about this? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I prayed about it. He goes, no, have, really? Have you asked God what he thinks and listened to him? And I hadn't because I had focused so much on my little dilemma and it was distracting me from really listening to the Lord. That's another sign of, of something being off. Uh, another thing that we do is... Uh, we, we sometimes can just worry about the future so much. We're worried about what's going to happen in the future. Well, how is this all going to work out? And Aquinas says that you can have too much anxiety also about the future. And when we're worried too much about the future, we're not able to give ourselves to God and the people in our lives in the present well. 
Um, my wife is really great at this. She, I, I, I can be someone that could worry about the future. I, I remember when we were first expecting you know, our, our first baby. I was so excited to be a dad. But there was another part of me thinking, okay, I've got nine months to read all the books I ever wanted to read. Uh, and nine months to do all the writing projects I ever wanted to do. I remember thinking, you know, my life is going to be radically changed, and after the baby comes, I'm never going to sleep again because I heard all about this, you know. And my wife said, we're not dying. <laughs> you know, and, and sure enough, then second baby comes, third baby, now I'm on to baby seven, I'm still fine. But, uh, but at the time, I remember there was a great quote that my wife uh, gave to me. She was reading from her own, her own prayer life. Um, and and it, 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 was, it was a very, very important point. She, it, I'm going to paraphrase it. It's, it's like this. If you worry about the future now, you may not have the grace to deal with it now. But you will have the grace to deal with it when you need it. And my wife will remind me of this quote many times. You know, she'll just, uh, she's very, very peaceful and trusting in the Lord. But there's a very important point that I can foresee maybe something's going to happen in the future, and I'm worried about that. But right now, it hasn't unfolded. It's not there yet, and I could be all anxious about it now. Because I'm so trying to be, I'm so attached and grasping at something I want for the future. And let's say God isn't going to let me have that in the future, but in the future, he'll give me the grace to deal with that. But right now, I'm just grasping after, well, I want to control the situation for the future, and I don't have the grace to deal with it, and I'm too attached, and what's that's going to cause me? Just great stress. I'm not going to experience the great peace and joy that comes in following Jesus and living the hymn and being more detached. And so that's the key thing from Aquinas is that why are we often given into anxiety and stress? It's because we're too attached to either the things of this world, thinking that we absolutely need them, or that we're too attached and it distracts us from spiritual things, or we're too attached to what we want for the future. But on the flip side of things, if we really are living kenosis and we're giving God everything, emptying ourselves, trusting our lives to him, abandoning our lives to him, then we can experience what Paul calls a great peace that's beyond all understanding. I want to share with you a, a story, and I, I really don't get this right most of the times in my life probably, but I remember back in, in, again in my 20s, when I first came back from Rome, I had my first job offer, and it was to teach in a little tiny town in Kansas called Atchison, Kansas, at a college called Benedictine College. And I was only there for a nine-month contract. There was a professor... Uh, a religious sister who was away, and I was just subbing for her for that one academic year. So just I thought, okay, nine months in Atchison, I can live nine months anywhere, that'll be fine. I, but I, when I got there, I loved the school. I fell in love with the school, fell in love with the students. It was a wonderful place, and I wished I could stay, but, you know, I didn't have a contract to stay, and so I knew I had to start looking for what the next step was going to be. And so I started making my plans for the next year, and there was a, a Newman Center at a big state university that was building a theology catechetical program for its students. They're going to have classes and certification, all this, and they wanted me to apply for it. And so I, I did, and I went down to visit the school, and they were great people. There was an awesome priest there, a great visionary, and it was a great job, and it was going to pay really well, and they, they were building up a new program. They're going to let me run with it, and I was all excited. So in many ways, this was like a great dream job. And another thing, it was a college town, and so there were a lot of other graduate students all around, a lot of people my age, and I was single at the time. I thought, oh, I'm going to probably meet a wife here, better, than, better chances than in nowhere in Kansas to, to ever try to do that. And so I was really hoping the job was going to work out, and sure enough, they called and they offered me the job. And I was like, oh, this is great. And I said, well, here, let me just, you know, as I always should, let me just take a day or two to pray about, and I'll get back to you after the weekend. And over that weekend, I just kept having this sense, I'm not supposed to take this job. God wanted me to say no. And I didn't have anything else lined up. It didn't make sense. And I didn't want to give up this opportunity, but I sensed he just wanted me to just trust him, to let go, to give it up, to not cling on to this chance. And so I remember how much it hurt to let go of that opportunity, especially not having any other options. I had no idea what I was going to do the next year. And I remember I got off the phone telling them no, and they couldn't believe I said no because we got along so well. And I, I mean, I had this stomach ache afterwards, and I was thinking, what am I doing? What did I just do? But even amid all that pain and uncertainty, I still had a deeper peace, a sense that this is what God wants. He wanted me to just lay this all out and just to trust. And so I did that, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then about a week and a half later, I got a call from the head of our department, a Benedictine priest, Father Dennis, he says, Ted, you're not going to believe this, but that sister who was supposed to come back next year, she's not coming back. 
would you like to stay? I said, amen, I'd like to stay. Uh, and, and, and I could see all in God's providence. Thanks be to God. It was right then. We, uh, so I, I accepted that. And then the next semester, we started a program with my friend Curtis Martin called FOCUS, Fellowship of Catholic University Students. It was born there at Benedictine College. I uh, ended up staying not just for nine months, but ended up being nine wonderful years. Uh, and then I actually, that very next semester, after having taken the job to stay on, found uh, the woman who would become my wife uh, in little nowhere, uh, nowhere uh, uh, Kansas, after all. So, uh, I, I, but there was that deeper peace beyond all understanding that can only be found when we actually live the hymn, when we are, are living total kenosis, giving our lives totally to God, pouring ourselves out, emptying ourselves, and not grasping on our own. If I would have grasped for that job, my life would be very different. I may not even be here presenting before you right now. Uh, that was so formative in my life that time. But I want to turn in our closing time to something maybe a little more serious here. Of uh, All these topics are serious, but serious for our own day. St. Paul, at the end of chapter 3, talks about those who are enemies of the cross. There are many whose minds are set on earthly things, he says. But he reminds us, our commonwealth is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this language about our commonwealth is in heaven, this idea of our, our commonwealth being in heaven, uh, the, you could think of this as the idea of our citizenship is in heaven. In Philippi, in, in, in Philippi you had, uh, this was a, a colony of Rome, and this colony was, you know, there were many Philippians that were very preoccupied with the idea of Roman citizenship. There were some Roman citizens that had been settled by a lot of veterans. So a lot of people that are protected by Roman law. Then there are others who are considered mere Greeks, had no security of Roman citizenship. But in Rome, there is one leader that is considered Lord and Savior. And that is Caesar, is considered Lord and Savior. But Paul, here, by saying our commonwealth, is in heaven. He's saying the real citizenship that really matters, the real citizenship of a Christian, is not on this earth, it's not the Roman Empire, it's heaven. And our ultimate allegiance is to the Lord and Savior, who is not Caesar, but is Jesus Christ. And I think there's a lot of application for Philippians in our own lives today. And I have a feeling it's going to become even increasingly so very applicable for the life of Christians as we continue to face greater and greater pressures in the culture to conform to a certain mindset, a certain way of living, of moral relativism. As, as we are pushed in this direction more, it's going to be really hard to confirm our, our, our allegiance to Jesus Christ. It's going to be tested like never before. You know, I'm thinking about even before recent events with the Supreme Court, there was a, a a, a, a young woman that, that I knew, she, when she was at college, and this is maybe about four or five years ago, she was at a big state university and was a Catholic and uh, was, you know, committed to her faith. And, and in her first, second semester as a freshman, she happened to be taking, I don't know, it was like a political science class, I think. And the professor asked the students a, a question in a, an anonymous survey and uh, various questions about political beliefs, religious beliefs, moral beliefs. And after class, she was walking out with her friend, and the friend asked her, hey, so what did you put for the question about gay marriage? And she said, oh, I, I said I was against it. And he said, oh, well, I said I was for it, and kind of smiled. He just kept talking about other things. He said, all right, I'll see you at the party tonight. Okay, I'll see you later. And then she goes to this party off campus at this big house that night, and all, everyone's just hanging out, and all of a sudden, her friend stands up on a chair and says, hey, everybody, I have an announcement to make. Guess what she put on the survey in class when the professor asked about gay marriage, guess what she said? She said she was against it. And all of a sudden, everyone started looking at her saying, really? You were against it? How could you be, how could you be so bigoted? How come you're so judgmental? Well, and she's just trying to answer, well, I just think it's wrong. I think marriage is between men and women. And they all, I mean, dozens and dozens of people, college students, start pouncing on her. Not physically, but just berating her. And saying, you are so intolerant, you're judgmental. And literally, after about a half hour, they threw her out of the party. She told me later on that when she walked out that party, she knew she did not ever want to have to stand up for her faith again. It cost too much. And so she started to become a relativist. 
She still would say things like this, well, for me, you know, I think marriage should be between a man and a woman, and that's what I want to do, but I guess if other people want to do that and that makes them happy, that's fine for them. Now, why did she change her belief? Because of the great pressure that she was receiving from her peers around her. And then that led to her justifying not just gay marriage, but she started saying the same things about abortion and a whole array of issues. And when your mind starts allowing yourself to make those kinds of moves, guess what else she started to do? As she proceeded in her college career, she started justifying immorality in her own life. And then she eventually stopped even going to Mass on Sundays at all. Thanks be to God, her last semester of her senior year, some other people reached out to her and she got reconnected and she's now actually working in ministry in the church. But I share that story because of what we're really up against in our culture today, especially in this younger generation. You know, it reminds me of something uh, Pope Benedict said actually right before he became Pope Benedict. If you remember the famous pre-conclave homily that he gave as Cardinal Ratzinger, he said this, he talked about basically one of the biggest challenges to living the faith today is this idea of relativism, the idea that there's no truth. You can have your truth, I can have my truth, but there's no truth to which we're all accountable. And, and, and so in, in a culture like that, it's really hard to talk about morality. And he said, quote, today having a clear faith based on the creed of the church is often labeled as fundamentalism. Whereas relativism seems to be the only attitude that is acceptable in modern times. So the idea here is that if you're not a relativist, if, if you actually hold on to some kind of religious belief or a moral belief, you're, you're going to be persecuted today. You're not going to be tolerated. If, if you express a conviction on, on some moral truth, you're going to be labeled a fundamentalist. If you say, I think abortion is wrong, people are going to say, you're so intolerant. Or I think premar premarital sex is wrong. Oh, you're so judgmental. Or I think a marriage is between a man and a woman. How bigoted you are. And in this culture, it's going to be harder and harder for us to remain faithful. But Paul is reminding us that our commonwealth, our citizenship is in heaven. And our allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Let's remember this conference, remember this letter, and remember from where Paul, Paul wrote this letter. He was in prison for the faith. Don't know if that is going to happen to all of us here in this room. May not. But we're all going to face, we're already facing hostility and persecution. The question is, will we remain faithful and remember our primary allegiance? Will we say with St. Paul that our allegiance is to Christ, our Lord and Savior? Will we say with people like St. Thomas More, who said as he was going to his death, he's often quoted as saying, I die the good king's servant, but God's first. May we be the servants of the true king who died for us on the cross, who gave up everything and in his self-emptying was exalted. And the more we live in that allegiance to that king and in union with him, in him, the more that we will be exalted in him as well. Thank you so much. Let's close in a glory be. In the name